Thanks for inviting me here. I'm uh, one of the producers of Big Data and I'm going to give you a different perspective and talk about the cell atlas that we are generating. But uh, I'm actually going to talk mainly about a uh, citizen science project. So I think this would be a better title, How to Make Gamers Do Science. But to start out, I will give you the background of the biology that we're doing. And uh, even though you're not biologists, I'm sure you all know the central dogma of molecular biology. We have DNA that encodes proteins. Proteins are the molecules that perform the function in our bodies. And uh, well, since I study proteins, I think they are very, <laughs> very important proteins. They're also the targets of the majority of all drugs on the market. And about 15 years ago, Bill Clinton announced that we've decoded the book of life. We have about 20,000 genes and we've sequenced the genome. And even though this is 15 years ago, we still don't know the function of more than half of these, the proteins that these genes code for. And when you study genes, you can just take a blood sample and study the genes because they're more or less conserved across all our body. But the genes that are expressed, so the proteins will differ from um, different parts of the body, different samples. So if you want to study all human proteins, you have to sample <laughs> the whole, all humans or the whole human and also at different time points. So it's a way more challenging project. And this is what we are addressing in the Human Protein Atlas project. Uh, luckily, uh, humans are also compartmentalized into functional entities. So we have ranging across scales. We have organs with specialized functions that are built up by tissues with specialized functions that are built up by specialized cells. And the cells are built up by organelles with specialized function. So the idea of the Human Protein Atlas is to make a map of where in the human body the proteins are expressed, because that gives us good clues about the protein function. Uh, and it's also known that mislocalization of proteins is also the cause of many diseases. So this is what we're trying to do, make an image-based map of the human at the different scales. Uh, so this is a, a huge project. It was started in 2003 and is headed by Matthias Ulen. And we're using an antibody-based approach. I'm not going to go into the details there. But uh, so we're using different technologies and we have a lot of different samples to try to map the proteome at different levels. So I'm uh, responsible for mapping the protein distribution at the subcellular and cellular level, creating the cell atlas. So our raw data that we generate is images like this. This is an image uh, from Uppsala here, from Fredrik Pontén and Cecilia Bergström's group, where we can see this protein, CD47, look in brown. So we can see that it's localized to the ciliated cells lining the fallopian tube. So that gives us biological information and clues about the function. And this is the cell atlas images. So this is one cultivated human cell. The blue is the cell nucleus. The protein of interest is shown in green here. So when I look at this image, I can see that this protein is localized to the membrane protrusions. And that also gives clues for the biological function. So all in all, in the protein atlas, we have 13 million images like this. And all are annotated manually by pathologist or cell biologist. So I think that this is one of the largest annotated data sets around. Uh, and it's a very good data set if you want to do, for example, deep learning. And these, uh, what we do with these images when we've annotated them is that, is that we assemble all the images and our interpretations of the images into a publicly available database, the Protein Atlas. Uh, it's open access. Uh, we have about 150,000 users on a monthly basis. And we see about five peer-reviewed publications using data from the atlas every day. And when I talk about the cell atlas, the atlas ac actually has four different parts right now. The tissue atlas, the cancer atlas, and then these two will be merged into a cell atlas that is about to be launched in two weeks. So that's the atlas I'm talking about. And I will show you some more images. Um, and just to give you some background about the biology and the generation of this big data. So we put a lot of the first five years, we probably mainly spent scaling up assays and doing this robustly high throughput in high throughput and optimizing protocols. So we use a lot of different cell lines. We do as much as possible using uh, robotics and uh, automated uh, uh, approaches. So if anyone is inter interested in that, I can discuss it afterwards. And the images looks like this. So we, not, we don't only look at the protein of interest. We also use some markers. So we use a marker for the nucleus. 
and we use a marker for microtubules and we use a marker for the endoplasmic reticulum. And this is very good that we have a standardized set of markers in all images for when you want to do computational image analysis. You can use these for cell segmentation and you can look how the other patterns relate to these patterns and so on. On top of these we use the in-house generated antibodies to visualize every human protein. And it can look for example like this. So this is uh, CD44 localized to the cell membrane here. So we generate images like this and then I look at it, we look at it and say ah this is a cytoplasmic protein. Oh. This is a mitochondrial protein, might be involved in energy metabolism. This is a protein that's localized to the endoplasmic reticulum. And this protein is localized to the Golgi apparatus. A nuclear protein, such as transcription factor, might look like this. So it all comes down to pattern recognition in a way. And from a biological point of view, we actually see a lot of patterns like this. This protein, in contrast to the example before, is localized not only to the nucleus but also to the plasma membrane. And we can see that about half of all human proteins are localized to dual compartments and this has not been known and it's very interesting to try to understand why are the proteins performing different functions or the same function? Could this be the reason for uh, off-target effect for drugs for example, unexpected effects? So this is something that uh, is going to be interesting to follow during the next couple of years. This is another example, um, protein localized to mitochondria and nucleoli. Why is that? We don't know. So we generate, we prepare about 500 samples a week, generate thousands of images like this every week. And this is not our main problem anymore. Our main problem is to interpret all the information that is embedded in these images. The rough classification that I just told you, that's a very rough classification of the main organelles in the cell. So the last five years or a couple of years, we've spent to try to refine these, pat these classifications. So now we can also describe more fine patterns, this is like lipid droplets or very rare events like uh, the cytokinetic bridge when two cells are just dividing or the centromeres that where the cytoskeleton anchors to the chromosome during cell divisions. We get very fine spatial information in these images. We can also find more or less new structures. This is something called rods and rings. It has a few known protein components and we have identified about 20 more. We still don't know the function of this structure. So we can still discover and try to understand new biology. Uh, but even though, and sometimes we can't really identify the structure, but we can still describe the pattern. This is different patterns of proteins in the nucleus. And likely they are performing different functions. So it would be good to try to at least the best would be to identify these patterns, but at least distinguish them would be very good. So all in all, we're describing 30 different patterns that belong to the 13 main organelles in the cell. But still there's more. There's more information in these images. Uh, and I think one of the most interesting aspects from my perspective is when it looks like this. We can see that there's actually a cell-to-cell -cell variation in this image. Protein is expressed in some cells, not in others. Sometimes it looks like this, sometimes it's only one cell out of many, and sometimes it's actually spatial variation. This protein is localized to the Golgi apparatus, except in these two cells where it's localized to the ER. And when you look closely, you can see that these two cells have just divided. So maybe this has to do with the position of the cell cycle in these static images. So that's something that we're working on, uh, but I'm not going to pre present it now. A pseudo-temporal analysis using computational image analysis of these static images using the reference markers and a deep learning approach. Uh, so there, there's a lot of information to, to <laughs> harvest from these images. And one way of doing that, besides the computational approach, is citizen science. And we I'm sure you know what it is. There are some very nice examples of when citizen science has been gamified, like fold it. Uh, it's a puzzle where you fold proteins. Very successful example. Another nice example is iWire, where you track neurons in the brain, also like a puzzle almost. So we figured that the, this is very um, 
an interesting idea, but these projects struggle with trying to recruit people to their games. So we thought that what if we could inject a citizen science task, citizen science task into an existing computer game? Because I think that people played, I heard the number, that people played World of Warcraft for six billion years in total or something. It's a crazy amount of time spent on that. Um, so we teamed up with uh, some other people and decided to do our version of citizen science. So the idea to inject it into an existing game was from this guy, Attila Santner, and then we uh, came up with the idea of what to inject, a mini game. And then we uh, teamed up with CCP Games, and a game producer in Iceland. And so it's, uh, we've integrated citizen science into an existing computer game as a seamless gaming experience, and it's a mini game for pattern recognition in microscope images. And the game is EVE Online. I don't know, has anyone played it? Not a single hand. Uh, <laughs> so it's a big sci-fi MMO game uh, with about half a million players and 40,000 people online at any time. And I'm going to show you the video that was broadcasted in the in-game video channel when the minigame was launched in March this year. The sudden drifter pullback to the five known hive systems are believed to be connected to the Capsuleer reports that gate restrictions in those systems have been removed, clearing the path for Capsuleers committed to pushing back the drifter menace. The conflict has certainly taken its toll on the Amar military, and talks of the withdrawal being a reaction to Sisters of Eve, and Capsuleer actions only adds insult to injury for the Amar. Meanwhile, Sisters of Eve has launched a crowdsourced analysis of collected drifter data entitled Project Discovery and rallied under the banner of Citizen Science Begins With You. They hope to unlock the new drifter tech so that they may be made public and shared with all. This is Lena Amber reporting for The Scope. So the reason that I wanted to show this movie is to illustrate how the game designers tried to integrate this game, this game mini game into the game narrative. So there are these powerful, scary creatures called the drifters that are invading. Um, <coughs> and what do you do? Well, you, you ask the scientists for help. So Professor Lundberg and the Sisters of Eve launched this crowdsourcing initiative that is aimed to map the drifter DNA um, and unlock the secret drifter tech, kind of. And uh, this is the start page of the game and you can get an introduction and you get a tutorial and everything. I'm just going to show you some screen dumps. This is what the minigame looks like. So the players get one image presented to them and then they get a lot of example images of all the 27 structures we want them to classify. And they can read about them non-biologically and biologically and we ask them to click on all the patterns that you see here. And this player looks at some different examples and reads about it, selects, uh, selects that it's the actin filament, submits the analysis, and you can immediately see that this was correct. So some images are control images, some images are unclassified, and this was a control image. And then the players also get uh, rewarded with in-game currency. So this is very different from the previous citizen science projects where you don't get any reward like that. And there's also a lot of uh, medals you can uh, rank up. You start out as a novice, an uh, an uh, analysis novice, and you end up as a professor of analysis. And you can also get this uh, this uh, project discovery specific combat suits and uh, other swag. Uh, so there's a lot of game design things around the mini game. But then if we look at the results, so it's been running since March this year, and these are the numbers from last week. So over 164,000 players has played the game so far. They have provided 17 million image classifications, so they're very effective, and spent 7 million minutes doing so. And if we, if we do the math, this is actually a bit over 60 uh, working years Swedish measures. So I would say that on based only on this, we can conclude that this integrating, using the brain power of gamers is a very efficient way. They spend a lot of time and they do a lot of classification, so that's great. But we have to remember that their incentive to play is completely different than the players that go to these Foldit and the other citizen science games. So the question that remains is,
do they still produce good data? And uh, just to give you some, uh, so we have an accuracy score. So using the control images, we measure how good the players are. And we only use the, uh, the classifications from the players that have an accuracy over a certain cutoff. Uh, and we al also use uh, well, hypergeometric hyper probability for determining when to close tasks because we ask players until we've reached a consensus. So the average number of classifications that we need per image before we reach a consensus is 14, and the average number of classifications that they provide per image is 1.4. So this is a little bit lower than the reality. Um, and we are about to analyze the whole data set three times to be able to look at the consistency and so on. And the fun thing wh when we're doing this in game is that there's a lot of people playing the game every day. So we can make changes and monitor how they're doing more or less on a daily basis. We get rapid responses. So this is the Hamming score, since this is a multi-label problem, uh, on a daily basis for the first three, four months. So this is where we started. And I just highlighted some points here that I mentioned. You can see that it's been going up and down and up and down and up, and now it's quite steady again. Uh, so in the beginning here, we started out without the control images. So the players got rewarded if they were in consensus with other players. And of course, we were expecting that they would game that system, uh, but not this quickly as they did. So they figured this out after a few days, and we saw a drop in accuracy. And we could also follow the social media uh, around the game, and we saw a lot of this, just cytoplasmid. <laughs> <laughs> so they agreed to just cytoplasmid. <laughs> but luckily, we were prepared for this, even though we were expecting it to be the nucleus. Um, so we, we I injected these control images instead, and uh, immediately we can see that the accuracy went up again. So they don't want to play unless they get, they want to get rewarded for playing. That's more or less the conclusion from there. And then it went on for a, couple of, for a while, and then when it, when it stabilized, we asked the players, so what do you need? And they told us that, well, all the control images that you have are very nice, but then there's shitty images <laughs> in the game, and we don't know what to do with them. So we made a new control set that also had super ugly images, artifacts, everything. And then we can see that this has actually slowly helped the players to do better. And now it's more or less stabilized again. So it's kind of fun when you can monitor it, monitor it in such real time. And then we're not quite ready to present the results yet since the game is still going on, but we can see this is uh, an analysis of the first round of the data set. So they are doing quite well. Average per class precision of 74%, that's kind of good. Uh, and they are subclassifying the patterns we want them to subclassify. Most importantly, the nucleus, the nucleoli, they're finding new rods and rings, and they identify a lot of cell-to-cell -cell variation. So they are providing good data, and it's kind of at the level of what computational image analysis have done so far. So besides this, it's been a very f fun, uh, um, experience and we got a lot of uh, media attention in journals we normally don't publish in like PC World and uh, <laughs> other <laughs> things like that and we also got a lot of uh, it's been a very rewarding to be part of this when we get the player feedback when we hear people saying that uh, the great thing is that I, I find myself reading articles Wikipedia and of course the HPA website to learn more and this is someone that is not even trained in biology so that's of course interesting and then also that we give classes normally about proteins and why you should study proteins and why it's important at universities. But of course, there's an in-game university. So a colleague of mine gives classes about proteins and how to classify patterns in microscope images at the in-game university. And there's more people showing up there than <laughs> <laughs> here. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so to conclude this, I think we've demonstrated the power of combining science and gaming. And uh, we have been able to, with the help of the gamers, refine the details in the Protein Atlas. And in a way, the fun thing starts now. We can start to compare the performance of a few experts with AI, machine learning approaches, and many gamers. I'm sure we're all good at different things. And we've also created an increased awareness of proteins, the importance of studying proteins and the Human Protein Atlas project. And you can still play the game if you want to. Emonline.com slash discovery, it's free. <laughs> So now, um, on the 4th of December, we're launching the Cell Atlas, a high-resolution map of the human subcellular proteome uh, at a meeting in the US. It will also be a poster in science at the same time, 
And here we have mapped over 12,000 proteins to 30 different cellular compartments, and all of them have images in the atlas. And we've also packaged this information into knowledge-based chapters describing the different proteomes and the, the organelle proteomes and the cell-to-cell -cell variation proteome and so on to help users to mine the database. And the project discovery data generated so far is integrated into this version. So, to conclude uh, with a more biological conclusion, I would say that spatial information is a very important parameter in systems biology and people, people often neglect this. Uh, it, it forms boundaries in the cells of what can interact with what, so you should take this into account. And our vision is to provide a final validated cell atlas uh, in 2023 and a holistic whole proteome uh, model, uh, subcellular model of a canonical human cell over the course of one cell cycle. And I'd like to thank, this is uh, uh, my team working at Scilab Lab in Stockholm and all the group leaders of HPA, my group and collaborators and the gamers and funders. So thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, you mentioned this in machine learning when you do the comparison for the accuracy. How does it goes with the gamers? Which one's better? <laughs> uh, well, we, the gamers aren't really finished yet, but right now machine learning is better if we just look at one round of the gamers. But when we combine that as replicate examples, I'm not sure actually, because we can also change, we can hire this cutoff for the accuracy score and things like that. So we're gonna, uh, no, it's hard to say, they're not too far away from each other. But the gamers are not very good with multiple patterns that are mixed. Uh, but since the accuracy of machine learning is very good and it's a very cheap, why did you pursue the gaming <laughs> application approach? Uh, yes, there is one very good reason for this, and it is that when we started the project, uh, we were stupid enough to design the system so that we annotate every sample and not every image. And if you have images at different positions in the cells and different samples, you might have variations. So one pattern might be present in one image, but not in the other. So when you want to do deep learning and machine learning approaches, it's kind of a noisy data set and we've been struggling with this. So we figured that the gamers can help us to do per field of view annotations. And then we can combine that with our other level. But uh, this, that is not something that we're communicating often to the players, but uh, that's a... So we hope that we can do even better machine learning based on the player Classification. classifications. <coughs> yeah, you're getting tens of man years invested into this. How much work did you have to put in to create the game? <laughs> to manage this, yes, we put a lot of work into it. And also to, when the game was launched, communicating with the players and giving feedback, that was a full-time job for two people for a couple of months almost. But we've been working on this project for about one and a half year before it was launched. And I should also say that this... Uh, uh, this um, middle... Uh, the guy that came up with the idea, he created this cloud-based API. So he wants to facilitate projects like this in the future. So we are sending our images to this uh, cloud and then he injects the images into the minigame. So it's actually built in a way so that he can easily replace the scientific task. So we are just the first project and it's going to be replaced by other projects soon. So I think that's also a very nice thing with it. Have you been contacted by other video game companies to create mini-game in their games? Yes. <laughs> there will be more. <laughs>